topic. I want you to take your Bible to Romans 11. Would you do that? Romans 11. This is one of my favorite chapters. How many of you know what Romans 11 is about? Anybody know? Come on. Say again. <laughs> Would you say something? Uh, I don't even know what you said. But evidently it was funny. Um, let me get there myself. Hebrews 11. Genesis, Exodus, Hebrews. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Hebrews 11. Anybody know? I mean, there's a key word in this chapter, guys. Here's, huh? Faith. Some people call it the hall of faith because it gives example after example after example of those who lived by faith. Now, fundamentally, when we talk to you teens and we, we want you to live for God, what we're saying is this. We want you to live by faith. And one of the greatest ways the scripture shows us how to do that is provide for us examples. Matter of fact, one of the greatest reasons we have our Old Testament is um, is just for us to see people, uh, real people, real real lives depending on God. And and it should encourage your heart and and as a Christian to say, hey, I want to live by those two words. I want to live by faith. Now, what we're going to do in Hebrews 11 is we're not going to spend as much time looking at each example as I want to look at the principles underlying why, what made these guys live by faith, what does it look like in action. And uh, so we're going to focus on that more in a broad sense. And I want to challenge you, and myself included, that um, you would actually live life by faith. And really, how do we know if we are or are not living by faith? We'll be able to look at that from Hebrews 11. Would you, would, I hope you found your place. You can remain seated for this time. We'll read together starting in verse 1. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let's skip down to verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I want to preach to you, teach to you a message entitled, Faith in Action. All right, let's pray together. Father... I pray that you would help these young people to um, not just to say with words that they believe in you, but that they would actually believe you, that they would live a life of faith, a life of dependence upon the Son of God who loved them and gave himself for them. I pray that they would live that type of life. Lord, we love you. Open our eyes to the truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you believe in God? Now, I'm not asking if you believe that he exists, though that could be a good question today as well. Uh, But I'm asking, do you trust God? Do you actually depend on him with the details of your life? Do you realize that every action and reaction reveals whether or not you trust or distrust God? It's one thing to say in church, man, I believe Jesus Christ. I believe the gospel. I believe Jesus is sufficient. I believe he's my security. Yet... To go about our week living as if he doesn't exist. Trying to find security in maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Or um, trying to find significance in um, something rather than Jesus. Nothing wrong with sports, but could we make sports an idol? And we begin to live for that instead of living by faith, trusting God. We actually uh, try to live our own life. And see, the fact is, everyone in this room, you're going to live life either one of two ways. You're going to live life by faith, or you're going to live life in unbelief. Now, um, a, Christian, a Christian should live by faith. But oftentimes, I think we find ourselves kind of falling backwards into unbelief. And instead of living like a Christian, we actually look like a, a non-believer. We don't look like a Christian. We live just like them. And God is going to call our hearts and say, hey, don't live that way. Now, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish believers who are struggling. They are facing persecution and they're they're tempted to kind of pull back. And the writer of Hebrews is to say, hey, no, 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 don't pull back. Rather, keep walking by faith. Another way of putting it is keep looking unto Jesus. And what he's going to do to encourage these Jewish believers that are struggling is he's going to use Old Testament examples and he'll say, hey, you want to know what living life by those two words look like? Uh, let me just show you example after example. Matter of fact, Hebrews 11 doesn't give us any command. It actually gives us no command at all. 
You go to chapter 12 is when he gives us a command to say, hey, therefore that you're being encompassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let, let you run your race with patience looking unto Jesus. But chapter 11 is just showing us faith in action. And I want to see what, what does that look like? I'm going to show you three aspects of what faith looks like in action. Number one, what does faith look like? Faith ignites desire. Say it with me. Faith ignites desire. Now, I want you to see verse one. It says, now faith is the substance of things. What's the next two words? Hoped for. Now, I want to talk to you about Bible hope because faith is connected to something of the nature of what you're hoping in. If God says something is to me and I believe it, that means I hope that it will be true of me. There's a connection between Bible faith and Bible hope. The word hope means expectation. I love talking to teenagers and I say this. I say, hey, what do you want to do with your life? One guy may say this. I hope to be a doctor. When he said I hope to be a doctor, it means that he, that's his expectation. You could say it this way. That's what he desired, right? And so when you, you talk about Bible hope, inherent in hope is this desire for it. And um, so that's why faith ignites desire. So when you believe something, that means there's an aspect of it that you desire it. So when a teenager says, I hope to be a doctor, that means he desires to be a doctor. Maybe a guy says, man, I hope to play in the NBA someday. And he's like four foot tall. And they get, wow, I believe in miracles, but, no, okay, but uh, I don't want to crush his dreams. But um, he's saying he desires, he desires that. So there's a direct connection between what we hope for and what we desire. Now, let me illustrate this way. Let's say, um, let's say your football team is playing, and in the first half, they get slaughtered. How many say that's a reality for your football team? Okay, all right? And they get, they get shut out. And so they go into the locker room, and they're, they're discouraged. I mean, their hope is low. They feel kind of hopeless. They're sitting there like, we didn't even show up today. We didn't play football. We did terrible. And, man, everybody's grumbling, and defense is grumbling about offense, and offense is grumbling about defense. And, man, I love coaches, man. I just love them. The coach comes in, the head coach, and, he, and everybody just kind of settled down. He said, hey, listen, guys, we, we didn't do so well the first half. But you know what? I've seen you guys play better football. I know you guys can win. I know we can pull together. And let me tell you what we're going to do. And for the next few minutes, he begins to talk about how the offense is going to change their approach and how defense can tighten up over here. And those, those players that were kind of slouching over all hopeless began to sit up a little bit. And they're thinking, wait a second. We played better football than this. Matter of fact, we've beaten this team we're playing. We can do this. And then they're, they're all of a sudden, they get excited and they start cheering. And they're, I mean, they're giving each other high fives. And then they do something that doesn't make any sense to me. And I play football in high school. I don't get why they do this. But they took each other's helmets and they're like, let's think clearly. Wham! All right. We're going to win, you know, like that's really going to help them. But that's, that's, what, that's what you do when you play football, okay? And, um, but here, here's a team, catch this. They, they actually left. Uh, they came into the, the halftime hopeless, discouraged. They had no desire to go back on the field. But the coach gave them some words, and they believed the words of the coach. And what happened? Hope. And hope created What? A desire. And they're, they're like, come on, coach. Let me at them. I mean, they were just, there, there's something about when we believe, they believe the words of the coach, it filled them with hope and it filled them with desire. Now, stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. But my wife loves Pinterest. Are you girls Pinteresting? Huh? Okay. Um, and she does things like randomly. Like sometimes it's like, like a meal. And that's, that's awesome. My wife's a good cook. Okay. Um, so she cooks a good meal or she cooks these like awesome keto desserts or whatever. You're like, what's keto? Don't worry about it. But anyways, uh, uh, she does all these things. And man, I just, I love it. Every once in a while she does something like with our house. She'll do some decor decorative type of thing, and, which is kind of neat. But sometimes she does something to herself. One time she came, we were in a fifth wheel trail at the time, and she came down the little stairs that are in there. And her hair was like wet and sticky. I was like, honey, what? 
what's that in your hair? I mean, it, it, it looks kind of s- sticky. Now, I, I was thinking when I said that, like, you shouldn't have talked about her hair. Why did you start saying something? Probably going to her. But she had this smirk on her face, like, I feel proud. And uh, I was like, what is that? She says, oh, it's, it's honey. Honey? I mean, your hair? Well, why do you got honey in your hair? Was it like some medical honey? Is it just like regular honey? What is this? And she's like, she says, no, it's just regular honey. Buy it from the store. And then she starts listing off why honey is good for her hair. And how it's a natural lightener and how it blows in the wind. No, she didn't say that. But, uh, but she just lists all this thing. And I'm sitting there with my arms crossed thinking, just kind of like maybe a little bit of a smirk. Okay, sorry, ladies, but a little bit of smirk. And she gets to the end, and I listened. Isn't that nice? You guys should say, good job, John. Okay? I listened. And, uh, and then she said to me, or I said to her rather, I said, Pinterest, huh? And she's like, yeah, yeah, Pinterest. But you know what's amazing to me? She, my wife, read an article and saw a picture of a girl that had a better version of hair than she thought she possessed. And it moved her to an excitement. She's like, she believed the words of the article, so she had a desire to do what? Try it, right? Now, let me, let me give you a guy example. Can you stay with me? I, I'm, us guys, we do this. We see, we go to a, a, a place like GNC, okay? It's like this workout place. And there's this bottle uh, of protein. And there's this guy that just has, I mean, his earlobe flex, okay? And he's just big. And you guys are like... That's me in two weeks, you know? And uh, maybe you, like, you read the back and you say, you do this for six weeks and uh, you're going to be a bodybuilder or something. I don't know, but all of us guys, we want to be a little bit thicker, a little bigger. And so we get this stuff and we're sold on it and we're trying to do the workout routine. What changed? We saw a picture. We read something about it. And uh, it, it filled in us a desire, filled us a hope. So we went after it. Do you guys see a connection between faith and desire? Faith ignites desire. Now look at me. You guys claim to believe this book. But do you know what I often see in your generation, and I'm not trying to be unkind. I see a lot of words, but I don't see a lot of desire. I don't see a lot of like, oh, I want to know the word of God. It's like, man, I could joke with you and I could stand with a bunch of guys and we can talk about sports. And you guys are like, yeah, I love sports. Talk about football. Oh, it's so awesome. Talk about basketball. Hey, what do you learn about Jesus? And it gets quiet. As a matter of fact, I've traveled all over the nation preaching to teen groups. And one of the most awkward conversations that I have is when I bring up God. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is our youth group is filled with people. Not, you may say, you know what the problem is, John? I'll tell you what the problem is. It's apathy. Our youth group's filled with apathetic teenagers. Now, let me just say this. I think apathy is a problem, but I do not think it's the root of the problem. That is a fruit. The root is this. You don't believe God. Because if you believed in God, faith ignites what? A desire. I remember talking to one of my friends, and uh, he was talking to me about this car. And I love cars, but I don't really care how they run. I just want them to run. And he loves a 1969 Camaro, 21-inch slicks, cow induction, and I have no clue what I just said. But you know how I remember that? That was in high school, and I still remember it. You know why? Because Michael talked about it all the time. He's talking about the, the pistons, and he's telling me all of how it works. And, and you know what I did to, to Mike after a while? At first, I would look interested. I was like, whoa, no way, cool. Started shifting my weight, and after a while, I'm like, uh-huh. Yeah? Oh, yeah? I, didn't, I could care less about the 1969 Camaro. I, I didn't care about why. I, there was no emotional connection between a Camaro and John Beasley. Why is it do I get the same reaction when I begin to talk about Jesus? When I talk about the gospel? I talk about God? You know, after a while, we have to really call it what it is. If you say you believe in God, but there is no desire for God, you are a hypocrite. You are not being truthful. Because someone that, guys, this book is jam-packed with the promises of God. And when you begin to live by faith and reach out for these promises, you experience the life of God. And it gets exciting and passionate. And you're like, I want to tell somebody about it. 
I can't wait to share my, my thoughts and faith about God. It's, it's so vibrant. But some of you, you don't have that. You know why? Because the Bible says this, Jesus did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Some of you, you're living life in the realm of faith, and God is not showing his mighty strength and power to you. Why? Because you refuse to take steps of faith. But the book of Hebrews is saying, hey, don't do that. You need to believe God and have hope and have a desire. See, faith ignites desire. But I, I got to get to the next point. We got to hurry. Number two, not only does faith ignite desire, faith builds conviction. You know, if you were to talk to an atheist, an atheist says this, I don't believe there's a God. Now, if you ask, why don't you believe there's a God? They would say, well, there's no proof to God. There's no substance to God, right? Isn't that what they would say? No proof, no substance. Well, here's the, here's the truth. This is what happens. Um, a lot of people says, God, show me and I'll believe. God doesn't work that way. God says, no, 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 believe me and I'll show you. He's not going to work while you're, you're in unbelief. He says, not, hey, God, show me and I'll believe. No, he says, believe me and I'll show you. And matter of fact, he said, when an atheist says there's no evidence, no substance, actually, Hebrews 11.1 1 contradicts that statement completely. Notice what it says here. Faith is the What? substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, that sounds like a definition because it says faith is. But it's actually not a definition. It's a description of faith. And Matt, you could supply the word giving. It's like this. Faith is giving substance of things hoped for and is giving evidence of things not seen. In other words, here, here's how it works. God gives me a promise or shows me a truth about him. And I just say, God, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to depend on that promise, and I take a step of faith. You know what God does? He gives substance, and he gives evidence to your faith. In other words, you experience God in that step. You know what that's going to, it's going to do? It's going to give you more conviction about the reality of God. And what, do you, what is it going to cause you to do? What do you want to do next? Take another Step, right? So you take that step. You're like, oh, that was scary. I had never taken that step before. But he substantiates that step. And he gives evidence to his, his strength and power. And you're like, wow, this is so cool. And you want to, what do you want to do now? You want to take another step. Now, now you're not just taking steps of faith. Now you're learning to walk by faith. Hebrews 12.1, you learn to run your race. You learn to run by faith. Why? Because you're seeing the reality of God. And matter of fact, if an atheist came to you and says there is no God, you look at him and say, you have no clue. Because the fact is, there is a real God. And he is powerful and he's changed my life and he wants to change yours. You know, I love storms. I do. Matter of fact, one of my life's goals, seriously, is to see a tornado. I don't mean like right in front of me. Or like, whoa, you know, you take it away. I just want to see a tornado ripping through some farmer's, you know, farm. Okay, that's kind of mean, but not, not the barn, just the field. Okay, anyways. Um, but I look, I, I just want to see a tornado. I just love powerful storms. And let's just say, I remember, I remember as a teenager, I would sit on my back por uh, porch and I would watch the wind kind of bend over those trees. And I'd watch the wind rustle through the leaves. And I would just like, and I would feel the wind. I was like, wow, I just love this wind. Now, let's just say you came out on the porch with me as, as, a, as a teenager. You came out to me and said, hey, John, I just want you to know, there is no such thing as wind. And I'll say, yeah, well, why do you say that? Well, you can't see it, can you? I mean, you, you, have you ever seen wind before? Well, no. And you just sit out there and you're trying to convince me. And I, I'm just going to be honest with you, I would laugh at your face. You know why? It's too much evidence. I mean, it's too much substance. I mean, I'm seeing the, the trees bend. I'm seeing the wind rustle through the leaves. You can't convince me there's no wind. But have I ever seen it? Well, technically, no, I have not. I'm seeing trees. I'm hearing leaves. I don't see the wind, but I know it's a reality. Too much evidence, too much substance. And my friend, when you walk with God, it doesn't matter how much atheist comes your way. You're able to say, I'm sorry. 
there is too much evidence and substance in my life of the mighty power of God. And you have a conviction. And I want to tell you, if you don't learn, learn to live by faith, you may well in our culture become an atheist. That is what is popular. That is what is trending. But as I said the other night, it is foolishness. And I want to challenge you as a child of God just to live the way you say you believe. Live by faith. It'll build a conviction in you. Another way of saying this, how many of you like roller coasters? Huh? Yeah, my roller coaster buddies. What's wrong with all you other people? Y'all are like boring people. Y'all are down there taking pictures, right? Okay. I love roller coasters, but there's two different types of roller coaster riders. Well, actually, there's kind of three, but we'll, we'll leave the third off here. It's two, okay? They're, they're the type of people that I call, like, um, they're, there's these people that I would call um, insane riders, okay? You might, you might say they, they're, they're the, the resters. I mean, they're the people, they're standing in line, they're pumped. They're like, whoo! They're getting ready to get their roller coaster, and um, that thing locks in, and they're like, whoo, let's do this. And, and they, don't, they don't hold the bars. They, they hold their hands up. Now, um, you know, if that thing popped open, you would, you would go out. You're like, live my faith in a roller coaster? No, okay? But that's you. You're just like, I'm doing this. This is tried and true. So you, you go with your hands wide up. You're screaming. I'm a good time. How many of you are that way? How I many of your hands up, don't touch, you're just really, okay. I mean, the roller coaster goes upside down, and you're like, wee, okay. <laughs> I mean, if it bro- opened, at least you'd be happy until you hit, okay? But uh, that's you. And then there's the other crowd, and the, the, not, those are the resters, these insane resters, and then there's the clingers. Now, you could spot them in line. They're standing there, they're nervous. You're like, you excited, bro? Punch him, like, don't touch me. You get up, and they're, they're really like thinking, I, I want to leave, but there's a line behind me, and I look really foolish, so I better get on this and just finish. So they get on, and that, that thing like clicks into place, and you're like, great, now I can't get out. If it's one of those wooden roller coasters, you hear the thunk, 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 and you're thinking, oh, no, it's my heart. Oh, no, no, it's a roller coaster, okay? And you're, you're going up, and you hit that first thing, and uh, you, you're, you're not, you're screaming. Now, you're not like, woo, you're, ah, you know? Um, and, and you hit that thing, and you're screaming the whole way. And then they have the audacity to take your picture, <laughs> right? And you didn't think about it. You probably would have been like, for a moment, but you did, and you're just like horrified tears coming down, you know? And you are scared to death. You're a clinger. How many of you are that way? Okay. All right, a few of you. Now, you may ask, John, which one are you? Okay. Now, I'll tell you what, this is, this is deceitful. I'm, I'm just confessing. Like last night, we're talking about confession. I pretend like I'm a, I'm a rester. I'm in line like, whoo, let's do this. And I'll get on the road because Now, if you were going to ride with me, you were sitting right next to me in the roller coaster. That thing would lock in, and you're looking at me. I'm like, let's do this, man. Woo! And if you looked away, <laughs> I'm grabbing. And then you look back, I'm like, ah, yeah. I might even do kind of that, you know, half on, half off, like one hand on, one hand up, you know? Like, it's like, amen, you know, whatever. But uh, I'm like riding this roller coaster, and I'm like, ah, let's switch hands, Whoosh, you know? And that's, that's how I do So I'm kind of clingy. I'm kind of, um, now, after I have ridden the roller coaster one time and it's proven worthy of my trust, I start to move a little bit more from the clinging mode to the resting mode. So uh, how many of you are like that? that? I mean, that's me. I'm just like, let me, let me prove this. I know it's going to come a day where I'm like, it works, and it doesn't, okay? <laughs> but uh, but I, that's how I am. I move, I move from this clinging mode to a resting mode based on experience. I want you to get this. When you live by faith, it could be some of the most fearful steps of your life and you are scared to death and you're clinging and you're fearful. But you know what the good news is? It's still faith because you still got on the roller coaster. You still took a step of faith and you're scared, 
but you, you, it, it's not a lot of faith, but it's, 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 it's just a little grain of mustard seed faith, but you took that step of faith, and then God substantiates that faith, and he gives evidence. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to cause you to kind of loosen up a little bit and say, wait a second, my God is all sufficient. My God is powerful. My God's going to take care of me. My God loves me. And before you know it, you're going to go from a clinging faith Christian to a resting faith Christian. By the way, you'll never be able to disciple someone properly until you have learned to rest in Jesus. And when you become a resting Christian, you could spot the clinging Christians. You're like, they need some help. Let's help. Come on, you want to ride this roller coaster with me? You know? And they're like, don't touch me. You know? A new believer, whatever, but you're helping someone else and they experience God. And not one word of God's promises have ever failed. So you know what you're going to find? You're going to find more and more people. And instead of there just being this audience of teenagers that say, yeah, I believe in God, there's an army of teenagers that say, let's charge hell for the glory of God. Let's do something that actually matters rather than just talking about it. See, there's this conviction. Do you see how that works? So faith ignites what? Desire. Faith builds conviction and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna state this, and we're gonna be almost be done here in just about five minutes, okay? Faith develops distinction. Faith develops what? How many ever heard, you know, in your church they say Christians ought to look different than a lost person? How many ever heard that? You've heard it this week, I've said it, okay? Um, yeah, Christians ought to look different than lost people. Question: what is the fundamental difference between a Christian and a lost person? You might think, it's the way they comb their hair because those Christians have weird haircuts, okay? Or you might say, it might be somebody like, how they dress, they, they look funny, or they must be homeschooled. I don't know, but, you know, you got to fill, fill in the blank. Some people, when they think of Christians, they think of different things. But fundamentally, what distinguishes a Christian and an, an unbeliever is faith and unbelief, right? And um, so I... A, uh, an unbeliever, he lives in the realm of unbelief. That makes sense. Where does a carnal Christian live? Does he live in the realm of unbelief or faith? Unbelief. Therefore, he looks like a, a lost person. Doesn't look like a Christian. Those who are spiritual live in the realm of faith. And the longer they live in that realm, the more distinct they look. And um, matter of fact, the language is in verse 13. Look at it. It says, um, it's talking about those, these patriarchs. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but had seen them afar off. Actually, if, 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 let's skip back. Yeah, it is verse 13. Okay, I'm going to make sure I have the right verse. Let's start over verse 13 again. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but have seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, that's the language of faith, and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, the, the, the language here, strangers and pilgrims. A stranger and a pilgrim is, is identity language, and they're embracing the fact that, hey, this world is really not my final home, right? You've heard this world's not my home just passing through song, okay? It, but you're living life differently. You're not trying to settle in like the rest of the world that's living in where? Unbelief. They don't believe in God, so everything about life is just about this life, right? So they're living for here rather than eternity. But if we have faith, we believe the gospel, we don't believe that this life's the end. We believe that this life is just temporal leading to something much more, right? So we're not living for the temporal. We're living for what? The eternal. Now, that alone is going to make a huge difference, right? Because you're not living for money. Because if you live for money, um, you're going to lose it someday. Now, the Bible said, tells rich people, hey, he's given you all things richly to enjoy. Nothing wrong with being rich, nothing wrong with enjoying life. But hey, let me just make sure you know, you, you, you didn't bring anything into this world, and you can take nothing out of it. So, uh, so as a Christian, if we're thinking and we're living by faith, we're thinking, hey, money's great. We can enjoy money. We can use money for the glory of God. But if I'm not going to make it my God. A lot of the world makes money their God. And why do they make money their God? Because they don't believe in God. 
predominantly. They believe that this life is all there is. So I need to make money, get rich, and buy nice things. As a Christian, you're not in this realm, are you? Where are you? In what realm? The realm of faith. And the longer you live and you begin to take the truth of the gospel and you apply it to your life, I'm not going to live for money because money's not going to last forever. I'm not going to live for my pleasure because if I live for my own pleasure, I'll just destroy myself. So do the flesh reap corruption, right? So the more I live by faith, the greater I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there's going to be a distinction. But this distinction is not that. Have you ever heard the holier-than-thou attitude? I am a Christian. And they're just all stiff and snooty, you know? No, when you live by faith, guess what's going to be your, the mark on your life? What's the fruit of the Spirit? What's the first three fruit of the Spirit, you know? What's the first one? Love. You live by faith, you will display the love of God. Live by faith. Love, what's the next one? Joy. And I love this. Who showed the greatest joy? Paul. When he's, he's in prison. I mean, they, they would beat him. They had him chained between guards. And he's like, Paul, you all right, man? You're in prison. He's like, I'm rejoicing the Lord always. Do you guys know that the gospel is thriving in this prison? I get chained between two guards. And um, as I'm chained, every 12 hours there's new guards. And guess what Paul does? He preaches the gospel to the guards. They get saved. Next. In 12-hour shift, more guards come up. Hey, guys, y'all heard about Jesus? They cry and they confess Jesus is Lord. And next, more guards come in. And Paul's like, hey, the gospel's spreading. I'm rejoicing. That is not normal. That is odd. Paul and Silas, Luke 16, they're in, they're in prison. They were beat with rods, chained to it. And what do they do? They, they pray and sing praises to God. If you live in the realm of unbelief, you're going to be fretful and you're going to be complaining. But if you're in the realm of faith... Isn't there a great distinction? See, as a Christian, you embrace, you know what? Life is hard, life stinks, but I have a joy in God that transcends circumstance. You got love, joy, what's the next one? Peace. Now, um, what is the world predominantly looking for in life? What are they trying to find in sex, in money, in popularity, in prestige? They're usually looking for some form of love or acceptance, joy in it, or peace. And as a Christian, if you live by faith, you have what? You have all three of those and more. And you know what the world's going to do? They're going to say, they don't have the money I have. They don't drive the cars I have. They don't have the job I have. They have very much less than I have, but they have the very thing I'm seeking for. And you know what you're doing when you do that? You're letting your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, Christianity should not be known as much as what we're against, though that is true, as much as what we're for. We're for the gospel. We love Jesus. And that ought to be displayed. I'm done with this illustration. There was a man by the name of C.T. Studd who was uh, known for being a guy who was very good at sports. There was this game called cricket, and that sounds weird, but it's actually a pretty hard sport. He, was, uh, he would have been known as like a professional football player today. He had a ton of money, but you said, you know what? He, he heard preaching by um, Hudson Taylor, and um, he hooked up with a, a couple other guys. They became known as the Cambridge Seven, and they went everywhere just preaching the gospel. He gave up his fortune, and he gave up his fame to be a preacher of the gospel. He took the, um, the gospel in several different places, and he just gave his life for the gospel ministry. Somebody came to him at the end of his life and said, hey, you gave up fortune, And you gave up fame. Was it worth it? And he said, he says, man, I would do it again. I wish I had a thousand lives and I would give them all to Jesus Christ. He said, I am a stranger and a pilgrim. Does that sound familiar? I am a stranger and a pilgrim living life expecting to see God. That's how he lived life. I want to live life that way. How about you? Are you living by faith? Faith ignites what? Desire. It builds conviction. And it, forget my middle word, creates whatever distinction. That's what faith looks like.